Welcome to The Trader's Handbook, a limited podcast series brought to you by IG in partnership with your host, The Finance Ghost. Over the course of our upcoming episodes, we are delving deep into the world of trading, helping both novice and seasoned traders alike navigate this exciting field. Join us as we unravel the intricate strategies and insights that define this dynamic landscape and the beautiful puzzle that is the markets. IG Markets South Africa is an authorized financial services and over-the-counter derivatives product provider. CFD losses can exceed your deposits. Welcome to episode eight of the Trader's Handbook, a really great series of podcasts that, uh, as you probably guessed, is all about trading. If you're only joining us now at episode eight, don't worry, you'll still learn some cool stuff today, but certainly recommend that you go back and listen to the other seven episodes. There's some really good stuff in there. And if you've been with us since the beginning, thank you and welcome to the latest show. As you know, if you've been listening, we've spent quite a lot of time with Sean Murison from IG Markets South Africa, just talking about the opportunities and risks that lie in trading stocks in particular. Now, that is very much my background, more investing in them than trading in them. And I've learned some really fun stuff uh, by playing around in my demo account, something that is highly, highly recommended. I'm not really a forex or commodity person, but I know we're going to cover them in shows to come. And I certainly look forward to learning more about that. But something I am is a stock index person, although historically I've done it through, you know, just buying exchange traded funds and getting broad market exposure, very much that investment approach. But of course, these indices are also really helpful for trading. So we felt it's a pretty natural progression now to move from having talked about stocks for the past few shows into doing one on stock indices. And essentially what an index is, is just a basket of stocks that follows a set of rules. Now, the rules may vary, and there are a lot of different indices out there. But some of the big ones, some of the ones that you'll certainly know offhand are things like the JSE All Share Index for local traders. You know, that is the go-to. Uh, that is obviously an index. The clue is in the name there. Things like the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, the Nikkei 225, all of these names that you kind of see as tickers along the screen if you watch any of the financial media, TV shows, or anything of the sort. You know, those are stock indices. And these are a huge part of the market, Sean. I mean, for traders, I would imagine this is probably even more of a focus than single stocks, isn't it? Yeah, so indices, as you correctly mentioned, it's a nice way of trading the market. It's simply just, you know, instead of picking one stock, which obviously has inherent risk, you know, kind of corporate risk, you group them together and you trade them as an index. I think there's like a natural progression for traders. A lot of people are introduced into the market. They start trading shares. They learn the mechanics of trading shares. And then they start to progress to things like indices. Uh, it can be a little bit more fast moving, but certainly holds a, a whole host of, of opportunities. But essentially what you're doing is you, you know, you're taking a, a view on the success or failure of, of a group of shares rather than just one share. So you, you're diluting uh, your risk essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the reason why people like it from an investment perspective as well, right? You're buying an ETF, you're tracking an index, you're getting a whole lot of exposure in one shot, which is quite nice. And obviously for traders, it's not that different, I guess. You're getting that broad exposure. You're not sitting with one stock that can go and release an announcement out of nowhere and suddenly move 20 or 30 or 40%. I mean, we've dealt with some of that in our risk management discussions on previous shows, how stocks can gap down, potentially gap past a stop loss if you don't have a guaranteed stop loss in place. Of course, they can gap up as well and deliver you wonderful returns, but you know you can't assume that that's the direction of travel. Unfortunately, the shocks to the market are often on the way down. So in an index, you know, you're, you're just not going to see those crazy moves, right? Unless there's a cataclysmic global event, and even then, a huge correction will still take you know, a few days. It's not going to gap down 30% in a day, right? I, I don't want to say it's never going to gap down 30% in a day because we haven't seen that. Yeah, we won't, we won't tempt fate, right? Very unlikely. I think the, the biggest moves we've seen on major indices, you know, range between, well, actually recently, we saw Asian markets really jumping high on stimulus efforts there. And we saw things like the Shanghai Composite, obviously, uh, representation of the Asian markets up, you know, 7% in a day, or the Hang Seng Index up, you know, 7% in a day. So outsized moves uh, can happen, but they definitely less seem less probable than if you're looking at an individual equity. I just want to say, you know, just when you look at those groups of shares, quite often when you look at those indices, they are concentrated. So it might be, you know, if we're trading in South Africa, we'd look at something like the top 40 index, you know, the top 40 most liquid stocks uh, on the JSC. But Quite often you find that, you know, the top 10 companies might have, you know, the highest weighting or they do have the highest weighting and account for even more than 50%, which is the case on the JSE Top 40 Index. You've got 
you know, you've got 10, 10 shares there. I think the cumulative weighting on that index is sitting at about 53 odd percent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is a fascinating thing to sort of add to your toolkit, right, is trading the index, not just trading the stocks. So let's talk about some of the differences between the index versus the stocks. I mean, I would imagine it's still a CFD, so nothing changes there. You're still buying and selling. Are there any other major differences that we should highlight here in terms of the actual you know, mechanics of how the trading works versus shares? A contract for difference, just to reiterate, is a contract for difference could be on anything. It could be on a pencil. <laughs> you know, um, obviously, here we're looking at financial markets. And so when you're trading a share in CFD form, you're trading a difference in price between your buy and your sell. If you're trading the index, you're still trading it as a CFD uh, with IG. And you are, it is the difference between the price that you buy for and then the price that you sell for. Uh, I think the difference there you'd look at when you're trading a share, you know, shares are priced in cents. And so it's the difference in cents value. And when an index is priced in points, so it's a different in points value. You just need to pick a contract size. So what does one point mean? Well, one point is you know, the value associated with it. So, you know, I just keep referencing our local market, the top 40 index, which is obviously a very popular product that we offer. And you could trade that contract at two rand a point or 10 rand a point or 50 rand a point per contract. So if the index moves 10 points in your favor and you're trading at 10 rand a point, then that's you've made 10 rand for every point that you've, that you've gained. So it would be 100 rand. Uh, other things to consider is that generally with indices, like products like Forex and commodities, they do carry a higher degree of leverage. So um, again, just, just you know, in the simplest of forms, leverage just how much your profits or losses are magnified in the market. So, you know, to take a trade, you require a smaller deposit relative to the exposure or the value of your transaction within the market. Okay, that makes sense. It just makes it more efficient for traders, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole idea there. Exactly. Easier to get in and out and to, to magnify short-term moves. And I think in some of our discussions, historically, you mentioned to me that it is cheaper to trade the index than the underlying shares. I mean, is that is that the case? And then what are the costs for a local index versus a global index? Is there any difference there? When you're looking at a, trading a share, you are looking at paying a commission in and a commission out. So you're going to pay a commission fee when you buy and when you sell. Now, shares will have an underlying market spread, which is another cost to consider in your trading, right? That's not a, you know, when you're looking at shares, that's not a cost uh, that IG uh, refers to their client or passes on to their client. It's just something that's naturally inherent in the market. Now, when you're trading indices with IG, uh, the difference is you, you don't pay a commission charge for your transactions what you do is you we add points to the spread and those points uh, are significantly cheaper than what you would pay uh, when you're trading a share so for example if you're trading a local share on the jsc that commission fee would be 0.2 percent when you buy and then you pay 0.2 percent when you sell and then of course there's that underlying market spread as well if you're trading um, the south africa 40 index that's how we label it on our platform um, RG's cost on that uh, to the client would be about six points either side, so 12 points. If you look at that as a percentage of what your total cost is, it's like 0.015% as opposed to 0.2%. So it's considerably cheaper. Um, and <clears throat> when you start looking at global indices, in the popular ones like the DAX, that Germany 40 uh, index, or things like the NASDAQ, uh, it's all relative, that spread cost. And it's actually... As a percentage of your exposure, that those costs are actually even less because those are very, very highly liquid markets on an international front. Okay, that makes sense. I can see why traders like it. You know, they get the benefit of lots of diversification. You know, the costs are better. It's more efficient in terms of leverage. All of this is actually good stuff. And I guess one of the other pros must surely be liquidity. I mean, I feel like there's always someone on the other side of a trade on a broad market index. It's not always the case on the smaller stocks. You can confirm that that's the case if, if possible. And then, you know, what other advantages are there here that we haven't actually already touched on that would make people consider trading the index? Yeah, so extremely liquid, like you correctly said, a lot of volume going through on that, which makes it easier to get in and out of trades um, and not, you know, sometimes with a share, you, you know, liquidity can dry up. And so, you know, the price that you want to get out and might be a little bit less favorable. Um, also, obviously, fix things like your stop loss when you really, you know, uh, reducing the sort of amount of slippage you might get if things did go unfavorably against you. Um, if you look at things like the higher leverage and reduced costs, it becomes more suitable if you're an active day trader, obviously, because cost would be a barrier to, to making a profit. 
Um, IG also does offer 24-hour markets on a lot of these indices, including the East Africa 40 index. It's the underlying market hours for, because it's based off the futures exchange, uh, for that top 40 index would be half past eight to half past five. Um, but we offer a 24-hour market. So once it moves outside of that, it correlates to what's happening in international markets. And so you can trade that well, pretty much 24 hours a day, five days a week. Uh, so just to add to that as well, I mean, we, we, we keep talking about the speculative side of, of trading, you know, looking to, to make short-term profit. But there are other uses for things like an index. So, for example, if you had a long-term investment portfolio and a, a number of different shares in there, and you're worried about the market starting to come off, um, it could be quite costly for you to exit your position in the market, all those positions. You know, you think, okay, well, market might come down, I might close all those shares, you're going to incur all those commission charges and all those costs. Another way to view it is, well, you could do something like take a short position on the top 40 index because it's a representation of a number of those shares, those liquid shares on the underlying market. Um, you could take a short position. So remember a short position, taking a trade with a view to expect the market to fall, maybe in the short term. And so if the market was to fall, you would generate a profit on your index position, which would offset the losses on your equity position. So it can be used as a hedging tool as well, not just as a speculative tool. Yeah, very nice. Many, many ways to do things in the markets. It's, of course, what makes it so fascinating and why we all love it so much. Of course, nothing can be all good, surely. I mean, there's got to be some cons to trading an index. Obviously, the one that jumps out at me just comes from my background as a more fundamental investor is that I want to go and read a management narrative and go and look at a balance sheet and go and look at their margins. And of course, when you're doing an index, you know, you're doing that for 40 stocks. You're not actually looking at that at all. You're really looking at a macro view. Uh, I guess you've got to be careful with some of the underlying constituents. You know, the South African index would be quite mining heavy, for example, whereas in the US, it's very tech heavy. So you still need to know what's in there. Uh, you know, there's still research required, but it's definitely a different kind of research. I don't think you're going and reading an earnings transcript too often to make a decision about an index. So that would be the one thing that jumps out at me, but I don't even know if that's a con really. It's just the nature of the beast. Are there any genuine cons around trading indices? When you're trading an indis, uh, index, I think it comes back to leverage. You know, I think I've said it before on the earlier podcast, you know, with great leverage comes great responsibility. So because your losses can be magnified more and the leverage, is, um, because the index is leveraged more, it is something to consider. But I think if a person's responsible about it and fully understands that side of things, I think they can mitigate that risk. You know, coming to what you're saying about the companies, you know, doing sort of uh, companies still have an effect on the index. So you can still do your deep research on those companies. Um, you know, I mean, obviously those top 10 companies, it's actually quite a strong banking weighting, obviously, after the elections uh, this year. So quite a strong move on the banking. So when you start looking, so you could do some sort of sectorial analysis as well um, on that. Um, at the moment, you're looking at, I think it's about 25% weighting of banks, ironically, um, in the index. Um, and then the you know your basic resource is probably sitting about twenty percent weighting there. So there is a case to be made that you can use some of the conventional deep dive um, stuff that you do from your fundamental background. Um, but yeah, in terms of risks, so going back to the risk discussion, I think the the leverage um, traders need to understand leverage. But I think that applies across the board. You know whether you're trading forex commodities, shares, or indices, um, because you know high risk, high reward leverage is is really something to consider and to be aware of if you want to manage your trading risk. So one last question just around the indices in terms of the strategies that people might use with them. I mean, I would imagine that day traders, you know, this is probably their jam, right? Is doing the index trading because of the liquidity, because of the costs and the efficiency and that kind of thing. This is, I don't think you can day trade stocks very easily. Maybe the very liquid stuff, sure. But would it be a fair assumption that this is where your day traders, your scalpers will kind of play? Yeah, because of that barrier towards making a profit is is reduced from, from your cost, then then definitely is a product that is uh, suitable. I mean, people do still day trade shares. You know, it's not um, it's not something that's not done because sometimes you'll get a huge movement on, on a share. So you're balancing off leverage. So shares might not be leveraged as much, um, but, you know, obviously sometimes you can get bigger movements on shares. So they can actually be a little bit more volatile. When we talk about volatility, we're talking about that range of price movement. Uh, but indices are quite interesting. If you're looking at, you know, just broad macro news, the scalpers might look at general news during the course of the day, look for big news events, whether it's around interest rates, growth, inflation, things like that. Look at when those news items are coming out, looking at what expectation is when that news is coming out. 
expecting a movement on the index because it's a representation of economy essentially. So um, nice product to trade when you're trading news, which does obviously lend itself to day trading, but not not exclusively to day trading. Obviously, we, we do have obviously uses like um, the hedging, which we talked about as well. And you can take a longer term view uh, on that as well. But certainly a lot of appetite for the very, very short term trading using indices. Perfect. So I think let's move on to that part of the show now where we deal with some technical indicators. So this is the approach we've taken in the past few shows where right at the end we deal with some text just because it's a lot to kind of take in and try to deal with as an entire show. As always, I'll include a chart in the show notes. I'll go and have a look at the IG Markets Academy to go and uh, see what great stuff you've got on this topic and maybe pull something from there to refer our listeners to. But, you know, we've covered <laughs> trend lines in the past couple of shows. We've done support and resistance lines. And this is really important stuff. You know, this really helps you see points on the chart where things might change direction or continue where they were headed for that matter. And both of those things are really useful pieces of information. Now, something else that is very helpful is trying to understand whether a chart is overbought or oversold. Now, that, I suppose, indicates whether or not uh, things might change direction given if it's, you know, if it's overbought, then it may well start to turn lower. And if it's oversold, it may start to turn higher. Who knows? But, you know, you try and use all these indicators to form a view. I think if you could just give us an overview of this approach and the value of doing it, and then, of course, some of the mechanisms that you actually use in making this assessment of whether something is overbought or oversold. Okay, great. So if we, I think let's just define overbought and oversold first. So we're going to talk about oversold conditions suggesting that a market you know to share or whatever financial asset it is has fallen and maybe it's fallen a little bit too much maybe that you know that decline is reaching a short-term end and we could see a rebound in price so that's oversold overbought would be the opposite maybe we've seen quite a strong rally and the price is uh, looking a little bit overextended i think that rally could be coming to an end and possibly changing direction now there's a number of Technical indicators that you can use are available, obviously, on the IG platform. Can assist with assessing overbought and oversold conditions, seen as a short-term indicator. And those are indicators which include, I think, the popular ones are stochastic and the RSI, which referred to as the Relative Strength Index, or RSI for short. For the traders out there and for the guys that are new to technical analysis, I think you can combine this type of indicator with some of the stuff we've talked about before. So we've talked about trends in the market. So markets don't generally move in a straight line. So if the market's in an uptrend, um, you might wait for a bit of a pullback to, you know, to, to buy. You don't want to buy at the top. You want to wait for the first little bit of weakness to join that longer term trend. And an oversold signal might give us an indication, well, maybe now that, that short term dip is over and we can continue to rally. Likewise, in a downtrend, if we, the market's trending lower, it's looking a little bit oversold and a little bit, we might expect a bit of a bounce. Then when it gets to overbought conditions, we might say, okay, well, uh, that's, that bounce has ended. Maybe that's an opportunity to sell into the market or to, to take a short position. So it's a, it's a nice indication that you can add to other forms of technical analysis, overbought and oversold. And again, this is stuff that you can just draw on a chart on the IG platform. This is an option available to you as a technical indicator. Yeah, so all these indicators are available to you on the chart, on the mobile device, on the online platform. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, there is a really good article on the IG website around the stochastics and the RSI and all this kind of thing. So obviously make sure that I include that in the show notes. And I really do encourage people to just go and read up about it and also go check out the stuff we've talked about previously, the trend lines, the support and resistance lines. The stuff really does make a significant difference. I guess, Sean, last question from my side, maybe just taking us back to indices and to close there. You know, is it the case that most South African traders, or at least that the most popular among South African traders, would be the all share index? Do you kind of see that familiarity bias coming through where people want to focus on that rather than the stuff very far away, SP, NASDAQ, Nikkei, whatever the case may be? Or do our local traders tend to lift their gaze to all of the international opportunities available to them? I think that, like I was saying earlier on, there's a bit of a journey. So we have traders come in, they usually start with shares and then they progress to indices. Uh, that appetite seems to be quite strong. So, you know, from a local uh, from a local account where you can trade that top 40 index, uh, it's, it's a vast majority of trades go through on the index rather than shares. I think it's more than 60%. I don't have the exact figure for you. And then we do have a split. Obviously, the guys trading offshore and, and, and the range of products that guys do trade offshore is generally currencies, indices, um, and some commodities, the popular commodities, things like 
golden oil. 100%. Sean, thank you so very much for your time again this week. And lots and lots of good stuff still to come in the series. We will, as you've talked to there, you know, get to some of the other asset classes like Forex, like commodities, etc. There's still lots of technical stuff to talk about. And to the listeners, I think send through ideas of what you want us to talk about. You know, we would love to respond to the burning questions you have. You can, uh, you know, reach out to us on the socials or whatever the case may be. And we'll certainly make sure that we try and cover some of that. And Sean, to you, thanks for your time. And I'm sure the, the Chinese stimulus has caused lots and lots of activity among the trading community in the IG markets community. So they must be keeping you pretty busy out there. Uh, over in China. So thanks for your time. And I look forward to doing the next one with you. Awesome. Thanks very much. Thank you. CFD losses can exceed your deposits. In our gorgeously diverse country, there really is a new reason to trade every day. Current affairs to political news can make the markets move and cause volatility, which can be advantageous to a trader. Diversify your portfolio by opening a trading account with IG and explore the possibilities of CFD trading or practice your trading skills on an IG demo account.